Good morning, everyone. Let's pray as we get to the study. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Please forgive us for our sins and send the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth of this study. In your name, Jesus, amen. And this, the issue of women's ordination boils down to a few different sub-issues. Um, it's an issue of leadership authority, both in the church and in the home, and an issue of who can lead a church in the office of church pastor or elder. And we can find qualifications of, of who can be church pastors and elders in the Bible um, in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. For, um, the second sub-issue is an issue of supposed inequality. Some claim that women are being held in subjection, as if to say they are being treated as less valuable than men. Uh, and unfortunately, many women are treated this way, but that's not how God in the Bible teaches us to treat women. Um, in, in, in any of the pastoral epistles um, or anywhere else in the Bible. Jesus treated women with the utmost respect and love. Um, he, you know, one of the first people to see Jesus uh, resurrected was a woman. It, it's, it's not an issue of inequality. Um, it's not an issue of keeping women supposedly lower than men. Um, men and women are equal in God's sight. And you can find this in Galatians 3.28. Um, but this passage in Galatians still does not give women the authority to be church pastors or elders or to be spiritual leaders in the home. Um, now, of course, there are single mothers uh, that have no choice. Um, I was in one such home as a child. My mother was single. She had no choice. She had to fulfill both roles. Uh, but this is not ideal. And this still doesn't give authority for women to um, lead churches in the office of church pastor or elder. Uh, another sub-issue is that it's an issue of how we interpret the Bible and an issue of trusting that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant, infallible Word of God. Uh, some people think that Paul was trying to keep women down. Um, they say that Paul was a misogynist or someone who hates, dislikes, or is prejudiced against women. However, passages like uh, Romans 16.1 prove that wrong. Uh, Paul was like Jesus. He treated women with the utmost respect and love. If we say that Paul was a misogynist, then we deny the other parts of the Bible to prove otherwise. Uh, plus, if such a person who was a woman hater was writing uh, was that way while writing portions of the Bible, then the Bible is not the inspired and, in, and inerrant word of God. Um, thus, we would be denying 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. By the way, if I don't quote the verse in this video, uh, just take a Bible and pause the video, take a Bible, and look it up, see what it says. Test whatever anyone says by the Bible. Uh, that's what everyone should be doing. Don't trust uh, anyone implicitly, I think might be the word. As far as what they say, don't take it as gospel. Uh, the only thing you should take as gospel is the gospel. Read the Bible, see for yourself. Uh, and another part of this this third sub-issue is that some people say that certain parts of the Bible were only for cultures that uh, Paul was writing to. However, there's an, there's an easy way to refute this. The only part of the Bible that we are not to practice today is the sacrificial system and the keeping of the Israelite feasts. And the reason for that is because they pointed forward to Jesus and what he did for us and is doing right now. Uh, thus, the ceremonial laws and the feasts were fulfilled, um, at least some of the feasts. The passages that discuss the issue of pastorship, uh, eldership, do not point forward to anything. Um, some of the feasts, I haven't quite studied the, the issue of feasts all the way through myself. Um, I know that some of them were fulfilled, I'm not sure about all of them, so study that issue for yourself too. Don't take what I say as gospel, study everything I say from the Bible yourself, as I already said. Uh, but Psalm 33.11 says about the Bible, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. So, um, if it's not pointing forward to anything, it's still binding. It still stands. The the council guidelines that Paul, that the Holy Spirit gave through Paul in regard to qualifications for a church pastor and elder, they're still binding. They weren't pointing forward to anything. Um, they weren't cultural, and, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, the fourth sub issue. It's an issue of breaking the tenth commandment. 
Um, and some people might want to tar and feather me for saying this part, but for some people, it's an issue of, for some women rather, it, it, again, I'm not trying to keep women down, but for some, it's an issue of coveting what is not theirs. Um, it's Again, it's clear in First Timothy and Titus, First Timothy 3 uh, and Titus 1, who God has assigned to be church pastors and elders. Um, God created us as men and women with different roles, and that's not a bad thing. For women who want to be pastors and elders, they're coveting a position that God has not given them. Uh, the fifth sub-issue is a threat to church unity. Some consider this issue as a distraction from spreading the, go spreading the gospel. Um, and be that as it may, because of the magnitude that this issue has come to, it, it needs to be addressed. You know, Satan wants few things more to f than to fragment God's church and to divide us into disunity. If we're not in unity, we can't finish the gospel. You know, uh, Satan wants to extend his life. He's got a short time, and he's trying to extend his life. He doesn't want to die. And also, he wants to take as many people with him to the lake of fire as possible. Um, read Revelation 20 for the lake of fire. Uh, therefore, you know, he's going to try and throw out every last ditch effort to elongate his own life and take as many people uh, with him as possible. Um, and deceiving people about the truth on male headship is one such way to do that. Um, as well as deceiving people on the issue of whether women can be pastors and elders or church pastors and elders or not. It, that's that's another way to do that, is deceiving them on that topic. Now, I'm not saying that women can't be chaplains or Bible teachers or Bible workers, things like that. Um, but God has an ordained order. Um, and when we are dissatisfied with what God has given to us and assigned us to do, we're dissatisfied with God himself. Um, when we step outside of God's ordained order, we invite anarchy, ruin, and death. And thus, when we, and also when we step out of his ordained order, we are in rebellion to God. Um, in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel, the prophet Samuel, is talking to King Saul. And um, Samuel was saying to Saul, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Uh, so, this verse tells us that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. God sees them as basically the same way. Um, you don't have to be a witch. You can be in rebellion. God sees them as just as one as bad as the other. Um, and stubbornness as well. Um... Leviticus 10, 1 through 2, and stubbornness can, um, is, is as iniquity and idolatry, as he said. Um, Leviticus 10, 1 through 2 says, and this is talking about Native and Abihu, what they did was they put, uh, God said, this is the way I want you to do for the temple services, but specifically this instance was the altar of incense. Um, and Nadab and Abihu didn't do it that way, so let's read what happened. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So because they stepped out of God's ordained order, something they knew was wrong, and they were honored by God. They were priests. Uh, among the first priests ever in the children uh, in the nation of Israel's history uh, as a nation and uh, they died for their sin uh, not to say that everyone who believes in women's ordination is going to die or be lost that's not my place to say but if we remain in rebellion and we don't repent yeah there's going to come a point where we'll die uh, where we'll we won't have the opportunity to repent because if we hold on to sin God's going to destroy sin and if we hold on to sin he's going to have to destroy us too um, and let's read 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 12. These are the qualifications of who can be a pastor or an elder. And, um, but before we get there, let's get to, there's another qualification that I forgot to put in my blog here that I want to get to. Not qualification, but, um, sub-issue. And this is the issue of, of hermeneutics. And some say that the chapters in the Bible, as we already said, dealing with the roles uh, of church 
and the roles of men and women were in the church were just for that culture that Paul originally wrote them to. However, the Bible disagrees, and we already read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Um, and again, we find Psalm 33, 11, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. And there is nothing anywhere in the Bible that says uh, what the apostles wrote about church leadership and male headship, <clears throat> or male headship anywhere else in the Bible, was only for the cultures back in then. Um, some say because of the culture we're in, we should be or we should be ordaining women to pastoral ministry and uh, church eldership for that reason. Uh, again, there's nothing in the Bible to support that. Um, they say that we should interpret the Bible according to the culture that we live in. Uh, again, nothing in the Bible says that. However, the same argument is made by those who say that Sunday is Sunday Sabbath. Because you really, you see, the same hermeneutics that allow for women's ordination, for women to be pastors, church pastors and elders, uh, is what I uh, should say. Those same hermeneutics are the same that will uh, allow for us to accept Sunday observance. And the day is coming when Sunday is going to be forced on us uh, as a day of observance by law. Uh, for any non-Adventists watching this video, we may get in, we sh we'll get into that in another video. Um, but the same hermeneutics also push for approval of, of homosexuality. Uh, the Presbyterian Church, PCUSA, just experienced a split over homosexuality, and before that they had uh, started ordaining women to uh, probably be pastors. Um, there are about six or seven churches in the last 35 years that uh, have accepted homosexuality as being okay, as being morally valid and morally right. Uh, and they all, all but, all but one, uh, they started in, in, in ordaining uh, women first uh, to pastoral and eldership. Um, not to say, uh, you know, some people argue with, hey, we should be able to ordain women to or, or lay hands on women to be missionaries or doctors or, or teachers, and, and that, that I'm not arguing against that. Um, what I'm when talking about is uh, women being pastors or elders. Uh, going to First Timothy three one through twelve again. Uh, notice the gender uh, of the gender exclusiveness of this pas passage as far as the qualifications of church pastors and elders. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, nor a striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subject his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also be for and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slander, or sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband, husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. And another passage about this is in Titus 1, uh, verses 5-9. through 9. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any, be, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless, as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, um, these are very gender-exclusive passages. It's, it's not an issue of which gender is the greatest. 
it's an issue of who God entrusted to lead both the families and the church at large. And, and it's not to say that God doesn't trust women. He's just assigned us as men and women different roles to do. And, and some take 1 Timothy 2 an extreme in order to try and prove women's ordination. They say something like, are single men excluded from being ordained then, from being pastors and elders? And the answer to that is simply no. Uh, from ordinationtruth.com, I encourage you to go to this website. And uh, they've got a lot of studies on the topic, a lot of studies on the topic. Uh, Secrets Unsealed also has a, um, a series on it as well that I've watched uh, uh, multiple presentations from. I haven't watched the whole series, um, but what I've watched, yeah. Um, they've got some good stuff in the videos. I definitely support Secrets Unsealed. Um, and um, the answer, uh, someone had asked a question on a comment on one of their articles about something along the lines of this, and the uh, one of the responses was, I believe his name is Kevin Paulson. Um, I think he might be one of the speakers in that series as well from Secrets Unsealed. Um, and the, he says, the answer to your question is, the, is that the maleness or the elder overseer is settled in the previous chapter based on the original created order. As the Apostle Paul was both unmarried and ordained, and was functioning as an overseer himself, the collective testimony of the text would certainly indicate that single men are eligible for ministerial ordination. The husband of one wife qualification means that if the, if the man in question is married, he must be monogamous. As one on our committee has noted, the fourth commandment doesn't, uh, does not apply only to people with children, or servants, or domestic animals. It simply means that if you have these, the command, the command applies to them as well. Uh, when one considers the collective testimony of Scripture, including the fact of Paul's ordination and continuing overshoot despite being single, it becomes clear that the command in 1 Timothy 3 simply admonishes that if the man ordained to ministry is married, he must have only one wife. Um, when, and here's another thing. and uh, When we step outside of God's order, uh, we're committing blasphemy. Uh, blasphemy is generally known as being claiming to be able, being able to forgive sins even though you're not God and claiming to be God um, even when you're not God uh, but there's another definition here that's uh, Titus 2, 1, 2, 5 let's read this but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith in charity, in patience the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness not false accusers, not given to much wine teachers of good things, uh, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So Paul is talking to Titus here about a little bit of, of um, what men and women should do. Uh, aged men should be sober, grave, temperate, other things, patient. Aged women should be... Uh, holy behavior, not false accusers, uh, teachers of good things. Uh, Paul encouraged women to be teachers right here. That they may teach young women to be sober, um, among other things, to love their husbands, their children, um, to be obedient to their husbands, um, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Uh, so if, if we're not fulfilling what God has told us to do, uh, you know, being sober, being grave, women teaching the younger women, um, among other things, where then we're blaspheming the word of God. Uh, now the issue is not women being in ministry. Uh, women can definitely be in ministry, teaching, preaching, chaplaincy. Um, here's a you know few scriptural examples. I'm not going to read all of these. Uh, some of them are full chapters. Uh, Judges four, Deborah, Exodus fifteen. Uh, prophetess, Second Chronicles uh, 34, 22 through 24, Hulda the prophetess, uh, Luke 2, 36, Anna the prophetess, Acts 18, 26, Priscilla in ministry with her husband, Romans 16, 1, Phoebe, a servant of the church. Um, so the issue is not women being in ministry, and the Great Commission is a charge to all believers, male and female, to take the gospel to the world, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, some more effective than pastoral and eldership church pastors and elders can do. Um, uh, being a Bible worker can be more effective. Being a traveling uh, preacher can be more effective. Nothing's, nothing is 
restricting women from preaching. I've heard good women preachers. Um, and what for for a quote from the book Evangelism um, by Ellen White. This is a Seventh Day Adventist video, so I'm going to quote Ellen White. There are women who are especially adapted for the work of giving Bible readings, and they are very successful in presenting the Word of God in its simplicity to others. They become a great blessing in reaching mothers and their daughters. This is a sacred work, and those engaged in it should receive encouragement. Uh, I know my own wife has ministered to me on more than one occasion when I've gotten discouraged, or uh, other things. Um, and she's definitely given me encouragement. She is my helpmeet, as uh, the Bible calls uh, women, wives. Um, 1 Timothy 2, 12-13 says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Uh, the issue in this verse is not women teaching in the context of Sabbath school, or being a military chaplain, or a hospital chaplain. The issue is, again, authority. Women are not permitted to exercise authority over the man. Um, and, there, and here's a question I have. How can a woman be submissive to her husband at home? and then turn around and be his leader at church. It just doesn't make sense. Um, there was an article you can find on the website, at Vindicate. Uh, I believe it's, uh, it might be at Vindicate.com. You can just check it out. Uh, it's called An Open Letter to My SDA Family. And um, a couple of quotes from this uh, open letter. Uh, all believers are encouraged to work for the salvation of others. And all believers are to work for the salvation of others, but not all are to lead in this work. And by the way, this was written by a woman. Um, a question with no logical answer is, but how can a woman submit herself to her husband at home, as it says in Ephesians 5, 22 and Colossians 3, 18, but then as soon as they walk into the church on Sabbath morning, he is, he is to submit to her leadership. Is she not his wife at church also? And again, from the same article, this issue is bigger than we think. For the same hermeneutics, and we went over this earlier, the same hermeneutics that twist these plain texts of scripture to ordain women as pastors and elders are the same hermeneutics that will lead us right out of the church in embracing Sunday as sacred. Please, let us not follow the example of Satan, who aspired to a position higher than he was assigned by God. Please, let us not follow the example of Eve, who, like restless modern Eves, was she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than that which God had assigned her. In attempting to rise above her, her original position, she fell far below it. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 59. Uh, she goes on to say, Please let us not follow the author, not, not, uh, not in Patriarchs and Prophets. The author says, Please let us not follow the example of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who were dissatisfied with the roles God had given them and sought the priesthood also. And these... Uh, uh, Korah was a man, by the way. Not all men are assigned to, the, to, to be church pastors and elders also. Um, for example, myself, I went to school to be a pastor, but that was almost eight years ago, and I haven't done it yet. So maybe God has another plan for me. Maybe he didn't assign me to be a pastor. Maybe he did, but it's in the future. We just have to trust what God has assigned us to do. And that's something that I'm still learning and still get frustrated about sometimes. Um, uh, male headship in the Bible. Let's go over that. From a study of the Bible, from Genesis onward, we see that God has order. God has order in the family. He has order in the church. He has order in nature. God has order in heaven. God is a God of order. And that is plain to see all over the Bible. Uh, another order that we see in the Bible is that of male headship. Again, this is not saying that men are better than women. We certainly are not. My wife, I'll tell you, she's smarter than me. She's stronger than me. Um... If we were to get in a wrestling match, she'd, I would lose. <laughs> um, but we are saying, however, that God has given us different roles. Again, God is a God of order. At the start of creation, Adam and Eve were created separately. Um, Adam was created and then tasked with naming the animals that God had created. Um, again, I'm switching back and forth between my log in my Word document because they're not exactly the same. Um, and if Adam wasn't the leader, if, if, they were, uh, if there was no submission from Eve toward Adam, in some sense, in some degree, then why wasn't she created at the same time? Adam being created first is an indication that Adam was the leader. Also, Adam was created and then tasked with naming the animals that God had created. That's a role of authority. Humanity was given authority over the whole earth. 
In this passage, God said to the man and the woman, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. However, only Adam was given the authority of naming. He named the animals. Uh, when his wife was created and brought to him, he named her. He called her woman. Uh, then he named her again after the fall. He named her Eve. Uh, Genesis 2.23, he named her woman before the fall. Genesis 3.20, he named her Eve after the fall. Uh, Eve was also created as, as Adam's helpmeet. Uh, Genesis 2.18, she was not created as his head, nor as his slave. From the book Adventist Tom, page 25, uh, we read uh, from Ellen White, Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. As far as uh, equality and value go, men and, men and women are equal. Um, but Adam was created as the leader. Eve was created to be loved and protected by him. That was the role God assigned to Adam, to protect his wife. Um, and in order for someone to be protected, they have to be in submission to uh, the person who is doing the protecting. Uh, for example, police. Uh, I know we've had a bit of controversy about that. Just forget it. Just, uh, that's not what I'm touching on. Um, but police have been commissioned to protect us. And as such, sometimes we have to submit to the police um, because of that protection. Um, and like I said, Eve uh, was indeed Adam's equal, but he was still the leader, as intimated by the order of creation, uh, Adam's naming task, and in the phrase, to be loved and protected by him. Um, the same woman, Ellen White, said on page 211 of Adventist Home again, uh, or maybe that's child guidance, um, so I'm... Uh, the husband and father is the head of the household. And um, in another book, this one's from Child Guidance. The first one is from Adventist Tom. The husband and father is the head of the household. That's from Adventist Tom, page 211. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I can't preach without reading, so pardon my, uh, I'm getting confused at my own uh, order of, of uh, sentences. But in the, another book, this one's from Child Guidance, page 480. Every, every family in the home life should be a church, a beautiful symbol of the church of God in heaven. Church starts at home. Church starts in the family. I like the way and one guy that I know once said it. You need to go to church before you go to church. Uh, in other words, um, you should have family worship every day, beginning and the end of the day. Um, but Sabbath morning, especially before you go to church, you need to have a family worship at home. Um, will make your day go better. Uh, the devil might still attack you, but put your faith and trust in God. Um, go to church before you go to church. Have worship before you go to church. Um, again, as I've already said, this is not about keeping women down, but it's about fulfilling the roles that God has given to men and women. Uh, let's look at another Bible text from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3 and verse 8 and 9. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. So men have to submit to Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Uh, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Um, men and women are to work together to spread the gospel. Uh, fathers and mothers are to work together to raise their children, uh, to love, honor, and reverence God. But we have given, been given roles to fulfill. Um, and you can even see the, the, the uh, truth about role distinction distinction in the Trinity, or the Godhead. Uh, in Genesis 1.26, God says, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Part of the order of God's design here on earth, as we've already mentioned, is that of male headship. And we can see the order of male headship also in the Trinity. In Genesis 5, verse 30, not Genesis, I'm sorry, John 5, verse 30, Jesus said, I seek not mine own will. Uh, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. And of course there is an objection to that. Some say that Jesus Jesus was only temporarily submissive to the Father's will while he was on earth, but that's simply not the case. Uh, going back to 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, in the head of Christ is God. And this was after Jesus had already ascended and gone back to heaven to be with God the Father. 
Um, so we can see that, that Jesus is still willingly, of course, he's still willingly submissive to God the Father, and, they, and he always will be. Um, the very fact there, that there is a father and son relationship between God the Father, and there always has been, uh, is proof of submission on the part of Jesus to God the Father. Now, God the Father and Jesus are equal in their beings, but in their roles to each other. Jesus always has been, and he always will be, in submission and willing submissive submission to God the Father because um, you know he loves his father the father loves his son um, and there had uh, let's go through a few uh, few quotes um, from Patriarchs and Prophets page 38 there had been no change in the position or authority of Christ Lucifer's envy and misrepresentation made necessary a statement of the true position of the Son of God but this had been the same from the beginning um, by the way, Lucifer fell because he wanted, he coveted a role that was not his. And he, uh, like uh, we talked about, the quote talked about Eve above, uh, she tried to rise above her role and fell far below it. Uh, same thing happened to Lucifer. He coveted the role, of, he wanted to be God. That was not his role. But because he coveted and refused to give that up, he fell far below it. Malachi 3, 6, and Hebrews 13, 8, among other passages in the Bible, tell us that God never changed. Um, if you watched in my other video about on the Sabbath, there are other verses that, that say that. I just don't have them quoted here in this blog. If Jesus has always been submissive to the Father's will, that means he always will be because he does not change. Um, from Signs of the Times, October 24, 1906, it is a mystery that one equal with the Father equal with the Eternal Father, should so abase himself as to suffer the cruel death of the cross to ransom man. And it is a mystery that God so loved the world as to permit his Son to make this great sacrifice. Uh, from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36, paragraph 2. The King of the universe summoned the heavenly hosts before him, that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his Son, and show the relation he sustained to all created beings. The Son of God shared the Father's throne, and the glory of the eternal, self-existent one encircled both. About the throne gathered the holy angels, a vast, unnumbered throng, ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, Revelation 5.11. The most exalted angels, as ministers and subjects, rejoicing in the light that fell upon them from the presence of the deity. Before the assembled inhabitants of heaven, the King declared that none but Christ, the only begotten of God, could fully enter into his purposes, and to him it was committed to execute the mighty counsels of his will. The Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven, and to him, as well as to God, their homage and allegiance were due. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants, but in all this he would not seek power or exaltation for himself contrary to God's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute his purposes of beneficence and love. So we see in this quote that Jesus is in submission, submission to God the Father before the creation of earth. Uh, one more from, I believe this is Lift Him Up, page 18, paragraph 3. Um, the Father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his Son, should be equal with himself, so that wherever was the presence of his Son, it was as his own presence. The word of the Son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the Father. His Son had invested with authority his Son he had invested with authority to command the heavenly host. Especially was his son to work in, in union with himself. Uh, let me read that again. Especially was his son to work in union with himself in the anticipated creation of the earth, and every living thing that should exist upon the earth. His son would carry out his will and his purposes, but would do nothing of himself alone. The Father's will would be fulfilled in him. And if we look at the Ten Commandments, we see real distinction there. Uh, commandment number one, uh, we are not to have any other gods before, uh, at all. God wants to be first in our lives. Uh, we, we cannot be happy serving anyone but Him. You can't serve God in money, you can't serve food, you, you can't serve God in food, you can't serve God in cars. God wants to make us, God wants us to make His role in our lives paramount above all others. Uh, the second commandment, uh, uh, against idols is pretty is basically the same reason as commandment number one. Commandment number three is you know don't take God's name in vain. Uh, God is God, we are not. By not taking His name in vain, either by sinful living or by using His name as a curse word, we are acknowledging our place as His subjects. 
Sabbath commandment. Remember the Sabbath. Um, if you have questions on the Sabbath, go back and watch my video on the Sabbath, or you can go to my blog uh, and read my blog about the Sabbath. But Sabbath. By keeping the Sabbath, we're acknowledging several things, and one of these is that God is the Creator. Another is that Jesus is our Redeemer, and therefore we are the sinners He came to save. God is God, we are not. By keeping the Sabbath, we are acknowledging that God is God. And it's, it's already a given that we are not God, thankfully. Uh, Commandment 5, honor your father and mother. Um, this one points out our duty to pay respect to our parents. Uh, we all have parents that it is our duty to respect. They are our parents. We are their children. I'm supposed to respect my own mother and father. My, my uh, child is supposed to respect me. Commandment number six, no murder. By murdering someone else, we're claiming that we have the right to take the life of someone else, a right that belongs only to God. Uh, we are claiming a role that belongs only to God if we murder someone. Uh, God doesn't murder, but it's his right and his right alone to take life and give life. Uh, number seven, commandment number seven, uh, don't commit adultery. That's a commandment that speaks, obviously, against adultery. Um, kind of redundant there, I'm sorry about that. But those of us who are married, we each have one spouse. My wife has been given the role of being my wife. I've been given the role of being her husband. If I were to commit adultery, I would basically be saying that I want someone else to be my wife, that I no longer want to be her husband. Uh, for the record, I don't want any woman beside my wife, just to clarify. Um, we, I'd be stepping out of the role that God has assigned me to do. Um, I won't get into it now, but with my story of my wife and I, there's <laughs> there's no room for doubt that, that God has uh, ordained for my wife and I to be married to each other. And if I were to say that I didn't want to be married, I would be stepping out of the role as God that God has assigned me uh, in being her husband. Again, I... I love my wife, don't want any other woman, um, just clarifying. Uh, number eight, you, you know, thou shalt not steal. In stealing something, we reject God as being the one who provides for us. Um, this harkens back to commandments one and two, where God's role in our life is to be our top priority. Um, some people steal because they're poor. Some people steal because they just want money. Um, but Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So if you're seeking God first, there's no need to steal. Don't bear false witness. That's number nine. Uh, or uh, many times we also make false accusations against someone else when we can't read the heart. One way this is often done is by gossip. And in doing this, we claim a role that belongs only to God, as only God can read the true motives. Uh, and the final tenth commandment, don't covet this is the same as number eight um, the two greatest commandments uh, love to God love God with all your heart and love to neighbor the first one love God by loving God with all our hearts we're acknowledging that God is sovereign over us and that we are his servants Jesus is our Redeemer and we are the sinners he came to save love your neighbor by loving our neighbor we are acknowledging that there is a specific way to treat them, and there are certain roles that we have toward each other. Um, you know, for example, um, the pastor, I, get, I take advice from the pastor. He is my spiritual leader uh, and representative of Christ. Christ is my spiritual leader, but the pastor represents him. Same with our church Bible worker. I've been taking Bible studies from him for months, and um, he is uh, my spirit. A, a, a kind of a mentor to me um, that God sent to <laughs> to help me have a relationship with God uh, and uh, I, I praise God for that guy um, but in a way he's he's um, my spiritual a spiritual leader for me in some sense because he's been teaching me more about God um, and uh, that's um, and one final thing if I can find the, the, um, the piece about it that I wrote. Um, I should have included this in this blog, but I didn't. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I do want to go and talk about it. If I can just get down to it. Yes, my computer is old and slow, so I'm working on it.
and <clears throat> but it's about uh, women in the Garden of or Eve rather in the Garden of Eden. Um, here we go. It's women in ministry, liberty in the Garden of Eden, and liberty now. Um, as we said earlier, there's so many things that women can do, and some of which are more effective than what men have been assigned to do in, in, as pastors and elders, church pastors and elders. Um, and there are going to be women in heaven who brought more people to Christ than some men did. Um, it's not an issue of equality, it's not an issue of who can do better, it's an issue of who God is assigned to do what. Um, in the Garden of Eden, God gave, gave great liberty to Adam and Eve. They could only eat, uh, rather, they could eat fruit from any tree, almost, except for one, and that was it. Uh, so great liberty and small restriction, there was only one tree they could not eat from. But the devil deceived Eve to think that God had granted them only small liberty with great restriction. Uh, in this recent movement to allow women to be pastors and elders within our Seventh-day Adventist denomination, I see a parallel. God has granted women great liberty to do great things for him in ministry, just not in the office of church pastor or elder. Again, it's great liberty with small prohibition. Um, could it be that those pushing for the allowance of women pastors and elders are deceived by the devil in a very similar, if not the same way, as Eve was in the Garden of Eden? Um, for a good video, a great sermon on this very topic, if you can search YouTube, uh, this is one of the sermons in that Secrets Unsealed uh, series on the topic of, of women's ordination, and uh, it's called Ellen White's View of Women in Ministry by Isaac Olatunji. Uh, spell his last name O-L-A-T-U-N-J-I. Isaac Olatunji. Um, and you may even be able to find it just by searching Ellen White's View of Women in Ministry, Secrets Unsealed. Uh, that's all I've got for you today, so be blessed and study this out for yourself and see what uh, you find out. Blessings.